to our time of worship and through the word. One of the most fearful realities in all of Scripture is that some people who think they are saved will be eternally lost. Thinking that they are on the narrow road, actually, that uh, they talk about in Pilgrim's Progress, the, the narrow path of saving faith, they're actually on the broad road of different religions that leads to destruction. And they will hear from the Lord Jesus Christ one day some of the most shocking and terrifying words any human could ever hear when he says, depart from me, for I never knew you. Not like I knew you for a while and didn't, I, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. To their horror, they will soon discover, too late, that there is an entrance to hell at the very edge, if you will, of the gates of heaven. Now, whenever the gospel is preached, it will inevitably produce genuine saving faith and also false faith. The seed of the word falls on good soil and bad soil. There will be branches who abide in the vine, and there will be branches that will be cut off and burned. There are those with working faith and those with demon faith. There are those to whom the Lord Jesus discloses himself to those whom he trusts himself and those not. Those who the writer of Hebrews says this, who have faith to the persevering of the soul and those who shrink back to destruction. There will be wheat and there will be tares that look like wheat for a time. As a matter of fact, in Matthew's gospel, and if you want to just listen or you can follow along in Matthew 13, Jesus used a parable about the wheat and tares to just illustrate this truth. In Matthew 13, beginning in verse 24, he said, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want to, us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root out the wheat along with them. Let both grow up together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, as was often the case in some of the parables that Jesus taught, the disciples didn't really understand what he was saying, and so asked for an explanation. And he granted them one a little ways down in the same chapter, in, beginning in verse 37. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Chapter 8 in the book of Acts that we're going to return to this morning has an example of genuine saving faith in the Ethiopian eunuch. But before we get to him, at first there is an appearance of one the first known satanic attempt to sow a tear within the church. Simon Magus. Simon at first appears to be a genuine believer. Even one as discerning as Philip accepted him and baptized him. And it says Simon even continued on with Philip. So he thus manifested right several marks of a genuine believer. It says he believed, and he was obedient to baptism, and he continued on with Philip. He illustrates, though, the difficulty of telling wheat from tares. And it's not until some things that happen later um, that we're going to see in our text today does it show us that, that he was not, um, at least at that point, saved. 
So today's message is entitled, The Faith That Does Not Save. I borrowed that title from John MacArthur's pastor, and I, I like that. As a matter of fact, Darren, apparently, before we left for vacation, he posted the sermon title on Facebook this week. The kids and I were helping some friends move yesterday, um, and uh, one of them said, uh, yeah, that's an interesting sermon title you have for tomorrow. I'm like, how did you know? You know, I didn't know that Darren had done that. It is, and I've even had been questioned already this morning, and I said, well, you'll have to listen to the sermon here for the full answer of that. So it comes from Acts 8, verses 9 through 24, so let's read the text. Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 9. Now, remember last time we're coming off Philip preaching in Samaria, the city of Samaria, and lots of people. It says there was great joy in the city. So there were people who were trusting in Christ. So we read on now. But there was a man named Simon. Already there's a the but. There, there's a contrast here. Who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing great signs and Uh, miracles performed, he was amazed. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on the apostles' hands, He offered them money, saying, Give this power to me also, so that anyone whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Lord God, as we meditate on this part of your word that records what happened here, and you have it here for a purpose, we pray that you help renew our minds as we think through this. And And Lord, bring application to our lives and perhaps, Lord, bring salvation to a soul who has yet to have true saving faith. And we thank you in advance for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. So where did Simon go wrong? How did one who seemingly had, you know, was so close to it miss out on salvation? Well, listen, folks, faith must be grounded in truth. And his was not, right? This passage reveals four glaring, glaring massive faults in Simon's theology. He had a wrong view of self. He had a wrong view of salvation. He had a wrong view of the Spirit, and he had a wrong view of sin. And those faults kept him from having a genuine saving faith and left him in a position to perish eternally. And folks, the same can be true of others as well. So let's start with his wrong view of of self. A faulty view of mankind keeps many people out of the kingdom. The view that we, mankind, on our own, are essentially good, that is as pervasive as it is damning. It lulls its victims into a false, false sense of security, causing them to think that God applauds their good deeds. Right? Because some people think, oh, oh, I, you know, God, I, I'm not such a bad person. In reality, though, he, he views those deeds and those who clothe themselves with them as filthy rags, the prophet Isaiah says. So any view of mankind that is basically good and capable, listen, this is important, of, of acceptance with God, it deadens, right, people to the reality of God's impending judgment. And blinds them of their need for a savior, 
right? If we could do it ourselves, we wouldn't need a Savior, right? We just need the right formula. And that's what many, pretty much every false religion believes. And those who fail to see themselves as sinners don't get that. Simon had an egotistical view of himself. It says, practicing magic in the city, amazing to people of Samaria, led him to claim to be someone great. But he saw how now in Philip's teaching a means to gain more greatness for himself. Now, the term magic here, by the way, um, referred to originally the lore of the Magi, the priest of Medo-Persia. Theirs was a mix of science, so things that were actually true and demonstrable, and superstition, astrology, divination, occultic practices, practiced along with um, integrating history, mathematics, and agricultural practices. So it could be trickery, but it also could be fueled by demonic power. Simon's hold on the people in Samaria was complete, though. Look, it says, all of them, from smallest to greatest, paid attention to him. They were impressed by his occultic powers. They exclaimed, that, "What this man is the power of God that's called great. And he accepted that. <laughs> the fact that this man accepted that title shows that at least initially, right, he had a view of himself that he was somehow on par with God, or he had God's um, work within him. And folks, this betrays one of the most heretical views of self that is imaginable. But yet, there are people alive today who have similar views. They think it's about education. We're all one. We have this oneness with the Spirit, the Great Spirit. We have divineness within us, Godness within us. And he had this view. As a matter of fact, and this is really telling, by the way, I learned this about him as I was doing this study, the early church fathers, okay, so post this time, they reported that this Simon was one of the founders of Gnosticism, which comes from the Greek word for knowledge, gnosis, and it was a false religion that, that says, you know, it's all about a secret knowledge that you can obtain, and they also reported that he viewed himself as God incarnate. Listen to the words from the book Heresies that records the writing. It says, the first two teachers to propagate Gnostic ideas were uh, within the Christian circles were Simon and his successor, Menander. Unlike later and more famous representatives of Gnosticism, both Simon and Menander claimed divinity for themselves. And according to their passage we're in today, Simon called himself the great power of God. The Greek term that he used, dunamis, later used by Orthodox theologians to speak of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Justin Martyr reported also that Simon's had messianic claims, that he claimed to be Messiah himself. So that's more information than we have in the Scripture about him. His perverted view of himself gave Satan an opening then to... Uh, spread false doctrine through the church. His false teaching later um, elaborated into full-blown Gnosticism, and it was to threaten and to embattle the church from the time of Paul for centuries. As a matter of fact, there are still some who basically have a form of Gnosticism that they practice. Like many charlatans and magicians of his day, Simon, though, probably believed in his powers. So it wasn't like he was an intentionally a fraud, and that made him even more dangerous and believable. And folks, it reminds me of the stories, true stories I've heard of voodoo priests right now in Haiti who, who actually demonstrate some power, and it's not from a godly source, okay? It's from a demonic source. It's not surprising then that the Samaritans, though, paid attention to him because he had, for, it says, for a long time amazed them with his magic arts. After it all, they, they did believe in God. They, they had messianic hopes. We talked about that last time. And that made them especially vulnerable to someone like Simon. Sadly, the people in our day, though, in our supposedly sophisticated cultural day, there are some who are vulnerable to charlatans who claim to be miracle workers in God's name. Right? Some of them are on TV, not all of them. I read just a couple weeks ago of some Christian tarot card readers 
seriously in America. Like people go in and they Christianize it supposedly and like, oh, you, you can tell your future and what have you. That, friends, that's forbidden in Scripture. Or a couple of years ago, I read an article in Indy Star. This guy was coming to town. He's a European. I forget his name. And uh, he was a gazer. He would just gaze at people. And he had just such a, this thing about him, this aura about him that people, all they did, they would come. They paid money to come in these sessions. So he'd be in a room. And he would just look and just gaze at everybody. And supposedly some sort of healing powers would happen. Not making this up, okay? People even paid for that craziness. So as long as Simon believed he was God or nearly God or had the power of God within him, right, he couldn't come to a proper sense of himself. People must see themselves as lost, as, as weak, as helpless without God before they can be saved. Simon was kind of locked, though, in pride's grip. So he, he didn't. And pride, of course, it's the universal and deadly sin. It is the most characteristic and controlling sin in all of human fallenness. And pride, by the way, is an easy sin to indulge in, though, isn't it? Since it doesn't entail a loss of public reputation, prestige, health, or wealth, with societies uh, in contrast to the more unacceptable social sins. Pride, in fact, has been redefined as a virtue. But sinful pride often manifests uh, itself, even in subtle ways. You see examples in the scripture. In Herod, remember the King Herod in Jesus' day? Um, it masked itself as integrity as he beheaded John the Baptist because he had promised his stepdaughter if she would dance before the group, whatever she wanted, she'd get. And then she asked for the head of John the Baptist. He's like, oh, but well, I got I to gotta keep my word. <laughs> or in the Pharisees, it masked itself as holiness as it rejected the Holy One. Or with the Jewish leaders, right, who masked itself as zeal for God, <laughs> and yet they killed the Son of God. Pride cost our race Eden, the fallen angels heaven. It doomed Sodom and Gomorrah. It cost Nebuchadnezzar his reason. Rehoboam, Solomon's son, his kingdom, Yehuziah, his health, and Haman, his life. The Bible has a whole lot to say about pride and how evil it is. To quote Job, they cry out, but he does not answer because the pride of evil men. The psalmist says that the wicked in their haughtiness of their countenance don't seek him. All their thoughts are there, are no, there is no God. Proverbs 6, 19 uh, talks about there's seven things that the Lord hates. And you know what tops the list? Haughty eyes, proudful look and eyes. Proverbs 8.13 says this, The fear of the Lord is hate, evil, pride, and arrogance, and the evil way. Proverbs 16.5 cautions that everyone who's proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Assuredly, he will not go unpunished. There's the famous, pride goes before destruction. Or a haughty eyes and a proud heart Clearly, in the Proverb 21.4, it says, our sin. So no one can be saved while clinging to that type of pride. Okay? Jesus pointed that out clearly in Luke's gospel in a parable of a couple of men who went to the temple to worship, and one, a Pharisee, very proud of himself, and he's, oh, Lord, I praise you. I'm not like other men. I fast. I do these things. I'm not like this this tax collector over here. And, and then there's this tax collector guy. He came in, he, he was so humble before God, he didn't even look up and he beat his breast and he just said, have mercy on me, God, a sinner. This is what Jesus said about him, Luke 8, 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. Okay, Justified before God, i.e. equate that to salvation, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. It is only with the humility of little children are we then fit to enter the kingdom. And one of the most powerful invitations to sinners, we saw this back in our study of James, James 4, beginning verse 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. 
Only the humble, aware of right their inadequacies, their shortcomings, their sin, have a sense of their lostness that drives them to God. It's the poor in spirit, not the proud in heart, who experience saving faith. Nothing short of a true estimate of one's wretchedness before a holy God, a broken and contrite heart that searches, knows it needs to be forgiven, right, prepares a soul for salvation. Simon, though, he didn't, that, that wasn't his persona, right? He had a different angle and motive behind all this. So he didn't have a, he had a wrong view of self, and he also had a wrong view of salvation. Now, his magic arts was no, there was no match for Philip's spirit-given power. Through Philip's ministry, a revival broke out in that city, right? The text says, when the people believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Philip's message consisted of two two parts, the the kingdom of God, in other words, God's sovereign reign over all things, including salvation and, and, and the coming of the kingdom that will be manifest one day and the characteristics of that kingdom and how that kingdom is entered into through the King, the Lord Jesus Christ, and belief in Him. So the name of Christ symbolizes all that He is and all that He did. So Philip preached about that realm and how it's entered into and zero, by zeroing in on the truths of Christ. Now because of his preaching, it says, many believed and were baptized, both men and women. As more people believed, then Simon, right, he saw his following dwindle, his popularity decreasing. And so they had a, probably a desire to be associated with this God that Philip preached and the Messiah, a desire to learn what he perceived to be Philip's power, and that motivated Simon. So after then being baptized, it says he continued on with Simon for probably three perceivable reasons. First, he wanted to sustain contact with the people who were following this preacher, and by joining Philip's movement... He, he went where the action was, keep his opportunity for influence alive as well. Second, he saw the signs and miracles taking place. He was amazed. He had, so to speak, a professional interest in finding out the source then of Philip's powers. And third then, as later shows his conduct, he was wanted to figure out how to acquire that for himself. Actually, uh, magicians in that time, they would sell um, tricks they would sell the information about how to do some of their tricks to each other and incantations. So it becomes clear soon that his baptism, right, it didn't symbolize true salvation. Baptism has no power to save, unlike what some people teach. However, it's important, right, it's commanded of all believers, it's to follow salvation, and though itself doesn't doesn't um, bring salvation. But Simon here seemingly viewed salvation more in terms of a ritualistic thing to go through, external matter, an additional act to be done in life, rather than a transformation of the whole person from the inside. Faith that does not transform a life is not saving faith, right? We talked about that a lot in James. For example, James 2, 14. What good is it, my brother, someone says he has faith, but does not have works, can that faith save him? The obvious answer to that is no. So also faith by itself, it does not have works, is dead. Someone will say, well, you have faith, but I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Listen, the demons, it says, believe. So don't be so impressed when you read right here that Simon believed. Okay, sometimes when it reports that on people, they're, they're t- it attends to saving salvation. But the demons, it says that about them. They believe, they tremble, but they don't have saving faith. They don't love righteousness, and they don't hate sin, evidence of salvation. Likewise, early on in the Gospel of John, early on in Jesus' public ministry, we read in John 2 of the crowds that says this, quote, in verse 23 through 5, Now when he, Jesus, was at Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, beholding his signs, which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men, because He did not need anyone to bear witness concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Simon believed in those signs, right? But he wasn't believing savingly in the one whose power was behind them. True salvation is not just 
a, a profession, not just, well, I said this, or a ritual act. No, it involves a divine transformation of the soul from where one goes from a love of self preeminently to a love of God preeminently. A, a love of, of the various facets of, of the sin that we hold on to to a love of holiness. Simon had a wrong view of salvation. He also had a wrong view of the Spirit. Word of Philip's amazing ministry reached the apostles, it says, in Jerusalem. And when they heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to check it out. Right? That the Samaritans were in included in the kingdom, that was shocking to devout Jews who despised them as half-breeds and outcasts. We talked about that last time. But for followers of Christ, they're like, wait a minute, Jesus said that we're going to be witnesses in Samaria also. So Peter and John were sent, or they went, right? And their mission was threefold. First, they came to really help Philip along with his spiritual harvest here. Uh, the Samaritans, there were so many of them, too much for one person to, to kind of handle the, what was going on. Secondly, they came, this is real important though, they came to give apostolic sanction and blessing to Philip's work among the Samaritans. The apostles, by Christ's design, were the leaders of the church, right? They're the foundation, the scripture talks about. Christ being the cornerstone, then the apostles that he commissioned, and from there it goes out. And so, even though they were in Jerusalem, they were still authorities in the church. And that's then seen, finally, in the fact they came down to Jerusalem, it says, prayed for the Samaritans that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Although it says they had believed and had been baptized, it says the Spirit had not fallen on any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of Jesus. Now, we need to pause here because this is, this is real important. Okay? Some people teach that Christians receive the Spirit subsequent to salvation. And they appeal to this passage and a couple others like it in the book of Acts. They argue, well, here's people who say, you know, they believe, they say, and yet they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Now, folks, listen, such teaching ignores the transitional nature of the book of Acts. Very important. Especially as you study the rest of Scripture about this topic. It flies in the face of clear teaching like this in Romans 8 9. You, however, not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ, akin to the Holy Spirit he's one with, does not belong to him. That is so absolutely plain. There is no such thing as a Christian who does not yet have the Holy Spirit, since by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews, Greeks, slave free, we were all made to drink one Spirit. So why then did the Samaritans here, and later we're going to see some Gentiles, have to wait for the apostles before receiving the Spirit. Well, for centuries, the Samaritans, right, and the Jews had been bitter, bitter rivals. We talked more about that last time. And if the Samaritans had received the Spirit independent of the apostles in the Jerusalem church, a rift, that rift that was already there would have been perpetuated, right? There, there would have well been two separate churches, Jerusalem church, Samaritan church. But God had designed there to be only one church. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but all are one in Christ Jesus. So by delaying the Spirit's coming until Peter and John arrive, God was preserving the unity of his church. The apostles also needed to see for themselves and give firsthand testimony to the church in Jerusalem and beyond that the Spirit came upon the Samaritans. The Samaritans also needed to learn that they were subject to the apostles' ministry. The Jewish believers and the Samaritans were thus linked together into one body. Do you see that? Do you, do you see? We're going to see, just like Jesus, the theme in Acts, you'll be my witnesses, first here, Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then to the ends of the earth. And that's what the... the, the thread, the theme that we see in Acts. And each time we see a similar pattern when the Spirit is given. And so today, though, and subsequent, this, the birth of the church, 
and this being done, this is no longer necessary, right? Because the, the Jews, the Gentiles, Samaritans, you, are all integrated in the body of Christ at the very beginning, and it was done in a demonstrable way. Now it's not necessary. So when then they arrived, Peter and John laid their hands on the Samaritan believers, and it says they received the Holy Spirit. That was too much for Simon. When he saw, saw the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Now, evidently, there must have been some sort of manifestation of the Spirit through these new believers. Does text doesn't tell us what it was. Maybe they spoke in tongues. Don't know. But somehow, right, he saw this happening, and there must have been something about it. It impressed him. It's just like, wow, right? And brashly and excitedly, then he says, give me this power also, so that anyone I lay my hands on will receive the Holy Spirit. He treated these two apostles as though they were fellow practitioners of magic. And he was ready to negotiate a price to buy the secret of their power because that's what folks like him did. By this act, by the way, Simon gave his name to the term simony. How many of you ever heard that term simony? Any of you? A few of you? Throughout history, that term has been referred to the buying and the selling of church offices. Okay? It became a rampant problem in the later developing Roman Catholic Church. It's one of the many things that the, the reformers like called them out for. I mean, people would buy, like, oh, somebody's wealthy, is like they want their son to be a cardinal in the church. Shell out money to the ones that were before him. It, I mean, it, became, it was a rampant problem. But listen, nothing God has is for sale. And certainly not the Holy Spirit. Indeed, nothing sinful men have to offer. We can't offer him anything, right? Salvation and spiritual blessing, he pours out freely to his children. The prophet Isaiah, uh, uh, representing God's crying out to people, he says, Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you may have, even if you have no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money, without cost. And yet there have been countless thousands throughout the ages who ignore that fact and have, have strived to, a futili with futility to buy God's blessing. Now, Peter, without hesitation, reacted in outrage against Simon's attempt with his characteristic bluntness. He said to him, May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Peter was irate, and what he said... Um, as I studied this, apparently most of our translations, it tames it down just a little bit. J.B. Phillips rendered it this way, to hell with you and your money. That's essentially what he was saying. Simon's view of the Spirit as a commodity to be bought added to his repertoire, that was utterly and completely blasphemous, and it betrayed a lost condition. Finally, he also had a wrong view of sin. Peter follows his con con condemnation of Simon with a call to repent, right? He says to Simon, repent of this wickedness of yours. Pray that the Lord, that if possible, that the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. He challenges Simon to have a correct view of his heinous sin, one that sees it for what it is and turns from it. The word repent in the Greek, metaneo, we've studied this before, means a turning away from and then a turning to, turning away from the sin and a turning to God. If Simon did so, it says the intention of his heart to do evil would be forgiven him. Peter also uses a, an Old Testament expression uh, that speaks of really most serious offenses against God. He warns Simon against the seriousness of the situation. He says this, I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. The phrase gall of bitterness is very strong. The word gall there refers to a bitter ingredient or bile. Coupled with bitterness, it conveys an extremely bitter, harsh, and distasteful condition. And it vividly pictures the reality of one who is in the bondage, like enslaved to iniquity. Sin is a harsh taskmaster. 
Proverbs 5.22 warns that his own iniquities will capture the wicked and he will be held with the cords of his sin. That's what was going on here. Simon, however, was not persuaded. Although he was shaken, maybe a little afraid, he refused, right, to repent right then and seek the Lord's forgiveness. Instead, what did he say to the apostles? Pray for me that nothing, uh, to the Lord, that nothing what you said may come upon me. His concern was to, he didn't want the consequences, right? True repentance, however, is more than just sorrow over the consequences of what your sin brings. As Paul later wrote, 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 10, as it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. And especially, as we know, more of the story written by the early church fathers of what Simon went on to do. Simon had a wrong view of self, of salvation, of the spirit, and of sin. And all that added up to a faith that did not save. Next week, as we continue on in the text, we're going to witness a faith that does save through the Ethiopian eunuch. But for now... What do we take away from this account? The same thing's true today as it was then. And I would say this, just two main points. And the first one is this, examine yourself. Examine yourself. Well, why, why are you saying that? I, it's not my idea, right? It's God's idea. God, through Paul, said it, wrote it in 2 Corinthians 13, 5 through 6. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? I hope you'll find out that we have not failed the test. Do we, do you have a biblical view, a Godward view, his estimation of, of self, of salvation, of the Spirit, and of sin. Do you really understand how bad sin is before a holy God? And that you, yourself, apart from Christ, right, you are a sinner apart from Him. A lot of people, most everybody excuses themselves. I'm not that bad, right? I have never hurt anybody. That's one of the first things people will say. Believe me, I've heard it. I, I've never hurt anybody. I, as a matter of fact, I, I help people. Now, I, I, I'm responsible. Oh, okay. But we need to remember anything we think, say, do that violates perfect, holy God standards is sin. And if God hates sin, he is not going to allow sin that's unaddressed in his presence, that is, that, that's been dealt with. He's not. The scripture says he will in no way pardon the guilty. He's perfect, just God. And as a matter of fact, well, some people start to talk talk about, well, well, I can, I do this, I've done that, I try to, I try. Well, Jesus said when he was asked about how one could basically be good enough, and he said, you must be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. I don't know about you, but I've never been deluded in the fact that I've ever, even after Christ, uh, been perfect. One day, by the grace of God, when we're glorified, we will be, but not till then. And because God is a just God and he will no way pardon the guilty, that's a problem. As a matter of fact, when I always talk about your greatest problem ever being solved, that is your greatest problem by far. Nothing even comes close. But God has provided a solution to that problem, of course, in his son. The eternal son who is one with him in all his attributes and his will and character, same with the spirit. He came and became one with us. 
Is there a better way for God to most perfectly reveal himself to human beings than becoming a human being also while remaining God? No. And that's what he did. But he didn't just come to do that and say, look at how great I am, I'm God. He also came to be the one, the perfect sacrifice to pay for the sins of the world. Because he's holy himself, he could be the one that satisfies the wrath of God. And that's what he did. By dying a death we deserve, paying the penalty, but then rising victorious, sh showing this God says, yes, that sacrifice was accepted. And what's more, yeah, he's, he's still who he said he is. He's the Lord of life, the Lord of glory, and all who are believing, trusting themselves in Christ alone will be saved eternally through him. So true salvation, then, is more than just a mere, well, oh, yeah, well, I heard of this Jesus. Okay, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, okay, good. Or a ritual act. It is a divine transformation of a soul from love of self preeminently to love of God. From the love of whatever our hearts get entangled with in sin to a love of holiness. So, as you examine yourself, do you meet the test? If you fail to meet the test, I pray that your realization of that is an awakening that's happening by the Spirit of God. And you will, uh, I, need to re I need to really repent. I really need to trust Christ alone. And if that's where you're at, praise God. And it is no, don't, don't, even if you're sitting here, you've been in church for all your life. It's, that's happened to people plenty of times. Praise be to God. Because not any of us who already are saved, it's because of any cleverness or goodness in us. It's because of Him. And if that's where you're at, I'd love to talk to you about it. Genuine saving faith comes from hearing and hearing the words of Christ. Secondly, and I tread a little more lightly here, but it is, I'll show you, it's biblical as well, evaluate others. Okay, not that we are the final authority on other people's salvation. We, we don't know for certain, and we're not called to that. However, we are. There are several imperatives in the Scripture for believers. You know what? The persons that you listen to for spiritual counsel, the people you entrust do they belong to him truly? Do they seem to? Do they adhere faithfully to what he has already revealed? You're, we are supposed to be discerning in that way. Whether it's a preacher, whether it's someone you get, you're seeking counsel from, this is the purest source right here. And as the, those who know him try, by the grace of God, to be faithful to what he said, then, okay, you need to, you need to evaluate that. Because there are many false teachers, and there are many people that will, even though they're not proclaiming to be a teacher, they'll give you advice in life. Are you going to listen to them? Better be evaluating. Secondly, does the person, single people in here, does the person that you're thinking of marrying, do they truly know him? Or the people you want to yoke yourself with and be, be bosom buddies and friends with, or maybe go into business with. All those are forms of yoking yourself, especially marriage, to someone, right? Scripture's pretty plain. Don't yoke yourself. Do not become unequally yoked. So that's false, trying to kind of get a feel for that. As a matter of fact, if you find that your life's repeatedly, you're like drawn toward, yeah, you, you're, you'd be interested in marrying somebody that doesn't know Christ, you know, the people that are most important and influential in your life, people you listen to, don't know everything out. If that's what your, that's your constant pattern, then you might want to go back to the first point and kind of examine yourself there. But having done so and believing you're in Christ, then listen, the people that are in your life, then as you kind of look and see and go, I don't think, you don't know for sure. Maybe you know definitively, because some will tell you. They're your mission field, right? They are the ones that you should be praying for. And in gentleness and respect, sharing the hope you have within you. Speaking of prayer, let's pray now together. Lord God, thank you for this part of your word and for the lessons that we may 
see in it. We pray that your spirit brings the application of the truths that are found here, Lord. And it is a sobering thing to think of. There will be some who don't have true belief. And I pray that that would not be true of any person hearing this message, or if there is a realization of it today, that there, there is repentance and true faith. Lord, help us to have a clear and understanding and view of where we are with you. Thank you, Lord, that you do save. Thank you that your salvation is perfect. And it, it involves more than just a ritual or just saying, well, yeah, I, 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 a mental ascension to things. The demons even believe in sh shudder. But true saving faith, Lord, results in a life that's being renewed. It, it results in a, a true joy that comes from you, a peace that surpasses understanding. And all that we have to look forward to. Lord, we pray that if there's even a soul here today, that's not true of that you would pursue them in such a way that they would see where they're at rightfully. Repent and believe. For those who have, Lord, we thank you for your salvation and we pray that you help us to rightly evaluate others, not as if we are the final judge and authority that we know for certain, but as we make decisions about who we'll listen to, who we might marry, who we might yoke ourselves to in life in different ways. Help us to see that and also help us then where we question whether there's salvation there, help us to be winsome ambassadors for you. And we thank you in Jesus' name and the people of God said, Amen. Thanks for your